are available outside on the agenda panel. And uh, there is a standing open for the QR code. So the report can be downloaded. May I request everyone outside to please come inside the hall. both 
UGC and AICP have now constantly been talking about skill embedded education. In fact, UGC has said 40% of the credits of the degree program can be had from the skills. So that means a normal student who is doing BA history, economics, can also have a lot of skill component courses to be taken in so that they become employed. As far as the ICT is concerned, because I led it for about seven and a half years, I know the kind of questions which were being raised about employability of engineering graduates. So we started off with several reforms. And one of the most important reforms was that of mandatory internship for all students. And that is where the role of uh, not just educational institutions, but also industries comes in. We may be saying that it should be made mandatory, but unless the industry provides that opportunity for students to go for maybe full semester or for about three summer vacations for two months each, we have no right to scream about they are not employed. And therefore, my often saying is that industry has to also come forward a couple of steps and the institutions also should go a couple of steps forward and not just meet in the annual ritual of seminars of industry institute interaction. But this is a common word. You know, when I graduated more than 40 years ago, this was what happening, and today also we keep happening in our uh, circle that interaction in the work. So from interaction to collaboration to the partnerships is very important. And each industry should identify some institutions where they will fit in in order to provide those skills. And similarly, every institution should have at least a module with about five to six industries, if not more, and then continue that engagement. So this is where we need to go forward in order to skill this workforce. And uh, on the other side, many a times we also see that even a skilled worker or a skilled manpower does not get an appropriate job, and therefore uh, there is a struggle that sometimes. Industry says that we are not getting right kind of people, and therefore uh, we are not employed. And some of the excellent institutions also face difficulty in order to get employment through the placements. So I think there is some kind of a mismatch, and therefore the uh, works of seminar like this, where we understand what is the future of jobs, what kind of uh, jobs are going to be created in the future, what kind of requirements are there, in what volume which areas, which geographies, both nationally and internationally. Because being a nation with demographic dividend, it is not necessary that our students who get uh, graduates or still need not work only in India, but the aging population of several nations, we have opportunities worldwide. But if quality is not there, there is not going to be any scope for employment, forget about abroad, but even in India. So how can we make our uh, education more uh, competency-based in the world? And many industries in the West also have started not employing graduates, but looking at the competence, the skills that they have. Some of them, non-graduates, are also getting much higher pay packages than ones who are graduates. I think these are big, big changes which are happening. And in order to support all of this system, government also has to fit in by way of uh, providing facilitation, by way of providing opportunities. And that's what is being done. Changes in the CSR rules so that more industries will put in their money in rightly scaling of the manpower is one part from the finance point of view. But on the other side, even the uh, opening of the skilling programs by the industry through the sector skill comes which is another part. So the most important part which the uh, Ministry of Education has undertaken in recent times is that of creating unique ID for all the students, which we have called it as APAR ID, Automated Permanent Academic Account Registry, APAR. And you all know that in our whole country, APAR means the meaning of APAR is the meaning of so an identity which will give you a lot of opportunities, a lot of uh, facilities is the one which is being created. Right from a child at the age of three, when a child enters nursery, 
upper KG, lower KG, right up to post KG. And we are. This is a lifelong ID, like our Aadhaar, actually backed up at the back end by the Aadhaar itself. So it's a unique ID, whereby every type of learning that is present under those can be recorded as an authentic source of information in the academic bank of credits to which it is attached. So quite often, uh, in a light of way, I keep telling that our State Bank of India and uh, Punjab National Bank, they are all the banks where we deposit money, which is a Lakshmi account, and where uh, you deposit your credentials, your learnings, in the academic bank of credits is the Saraswati account. And I think we need to encourage our students to have all variety of credits. And in fact, all, you know, almost about more than the half the universities have onboarded their students, along with depositing their formal credits for the coursework to be included in that. But what we have gone ahead is beyond that. You must be aware that uh, a couple of months back, uh, Honorable Minister opened what is known as Swayam Plus Plan. Swayam was the original platform, which is the MOOC platform that all courses were there. Then uh, Swayam 2.0 was handed over to IIT Madras from AICT to the continuity further engagement. More than about 6,000 courses are there. More than 3,000 students are uh, in, in, you know, enrolled into that. Every year, about 25 30 lakh students do take them. But what was observed was all of them were exactly like our university curriculum, theoretical knowledge, whereas uh, practical insight was lacking, and that's why. The courses from industry were onboarded under Swayam Plus, and today several lakh of students are taking those courses which are beyond the level. But even such courses, when they are done, they should get deposited into the academic bank of credits. That mechanism is in place. Whereby, if the university wishes, their Senate and Academic Council agrees, they can be considered as part of the credits of the formal program. We allow a lot, lot of electives to be taken, so let them be treated as electives, and the student may take lesser number of formal credits of the university program, so that he has or she has more number of experiential learning, practical aspects to be engaged with, whereby the employability enhances. This is number one. Suppose the university says that our curriculum is sacrosanct, we don't allow, still this will be available on to the academic bank of credits. So when a student applies for jobs, student applies for higher studies, student applies even for a loan for uh, starting the startup journey or entrepreneurial journey, this can come in handy because this is an authentic record, truthful record of the student of this journey. We also have several competitions which are held in nature. Uh, some of them technical competitions, software competitions, circuit design competitions, robotics competitions, robocon, uh, Maha competitions. Students do spend about six to eight months. Some of them work day and night. And if we don't creditize that and allow them to be accumulated into part of the system, I think the interest of the student will wane. And therefore, they are also allowed to be taken as part of the credit. Students may do a lot of cultural activities, music, dance, drama, sports, anything and everything, including social activities, engaging with NGOs, can all become part of Of course, uh, internship is very important thing. All of that is creditizable. So I think in whatever form we can engage with the universities and colleges in order to create an employable manpower, those attempts are happening. But the most important part, uh, which is missing in our entire education system, be it in skilling or be it in higher education, is that most of our education, unfortunately, still is continued in English. And we find that uh, students have uh, done their 10th grade, 12th grade in their own mother tongue, and many times are found wanting and they do not come to higher education because they feel that they will not be able to perform. Therefore, how do we engage students from rural areas, remote areas, who have learned in their respective languages to come forward for higher education, for skill education? We need to impart all this in the local languages or the mother tongue. How do we support that is an important thing. 
And I'm very happy and delighted that when uh, AICT started about five years ago, to tell him that you know, we should have even programs in engineering in Malakkan, we should be blocking, said that how can it be possible. Uh, we said that how Germany can do it and how France can do it and Japan can do it, China can do it, but like our country, our population of the state is almost equal to the population of that country and they are doing it, we can ask them. But to support them, we required books, which are required for reading, writing, etc. And therefore, we the started creating a very innovative AI-based translation tool called Anuva Devi. Today, it can translate any content in any language into any other Indian language and also into many foreign languages. And it is, in fact, uh, including files which are there in different formats, which are in the printable format of Koro uh, Draw or any word file or PDF file can be converted into exactly the same photocopy of that in any other language. And uh, fairly accurate. <coughs> in the same way, the uh, Minister of Skill realized this, that the skilling is also to be done in local language. All their books, 711 of such books which are there for different skilling domains, they were translated to this school into Indian language. I think this is where empowerment is possible. So while the industry is also looking forward for various types of engagements, I think make use of the technology that we are the delivery of technology. We have a variety of platforms. My uh, is there, who have their own uh, platforms, and many others who are in the panel, they have their own platforms. Okay, how do we reach out to our children in remote areas is the most important part. But those who are in the metros, cities, towns, for them the access is much easier. So the national education policy stands on these five pillars of access, equity, quality, affordability, and accountability. I think these are five very important things. And therefore, if we create platforms which will have level playing field for all of them, so affordable education, ensure that more and more students will become employed. Even though that many number of jobs are not there for this, we always keep saying that if they are very well skilled, they will get the job. I am doubtful about it. The future of jobs and the type of jobs and the numbers do not match the number of uh, Indian citizens that are there who are taking that education. So how do we also create our students to be entrepreneurs? How can they be also innovative? Thereby they will start their own small business where Maybe they will employ five, ten people is also equally important. And that support system also should come from both educational institutions as well as from the university. For that, again, uh, the Minister of uh, Skill Development and Entrepreneurship is putting in efforts. The Minister of Education is also putting in efforts. I'm sure as we go along, and we are all dreaming to become the largest economy in a couple of uh, years, already being in the fifth position, we are very close to fourth and third. If you have to achieve all of that, skilling, employment, and innovation, uh, these are very important. And therefore, uh, setting up of innovation centers in all the educational institutions, including small institutions, even in the schools, is very, very important. And last but not the least, but not directly related, but I would like to still reiterate is our examination system has to be reformed. We may reform everything else. But if the examination still continues to be on the basis of growth learning, I think our students will never become innovative. And therefore, how their learning has to be in the form of uh, application of knowledge and questions to be set right from school education to higher education must be in a manner that students start becoming creative, innovative, thereby all the problems which we are discussing will be solved. The last day, large number of our students who are graduating from different colleges and universities today are engaged in creating their startup. It's a good sign. Uh, starting from about 10 years ago, hardly there were 400 plus startups registered today. The number has crossed 1 lakh 20,000. So that itself shows that there is enough opportunity for everyone, provided we put in our best. And therefore, excelling in whatever we do is the most important. So that it is a skilling domain, whether it is in higher education. We need to be as
as good as possible, and that is the spirit with which we should move forward. I think uh, I just close here. Otherwise, professors have bad habit of speaking for a long time. So I'll close my talk here, and then I'll sit in the, the panel here. And if uh, Mayan has questions, he's most welcome to ask any one of the panelists, and I'll also suggestions from the audience here for the really enlightened audience here. Thank you very much. Namaskar. Thank you. Sorry. Thanks a lot, sir. Uh, I know that for you, uh, innovation, employability, employment, and skill, education, sort of is something that you're really passionate about. Uh, and I think today's context, I was just thinking when I came here and we were discussing with Vicky that we should establish the panel. Um, uh, and then when I was just talking to them, I realized that there's not a single one on the panel who comes from the education background and the skilling background. It's very interesting the reason why this panel got created and therefore we'll just talk about that later. But sir, before just to set the context, I think today's uh, objective is to talk about how all stakeholders will come together. I just want to leave certain statistics for all of you out there. Uh, so India today is the largest youth population in the world. Uh, one in every four youth uh, is an Indian globally. Uh, by 2050, uh, we expect that 2 billion population of the world will be above the age of 60 years. And India today is the youngest population, will continue to be one of the youngest population. I think uh, while growing up, you spoke about demographic dividend. Uh, we used to have a debate, sir, which was about, is population growth a boon or a gain? Is it demographic disaster or demographic dividend? I think today we have turned it around into dividend. And I think stealing, therefore, becomes a very critical part if you want to move this opportunity of being the youngest population and the largest youth population into becoming a soft power globally, because India does not have too many natural resources. Our human talent is one of our biggest natural resources that, that has been given to us. I think today's panel and therefore has been curated and created to understand the industry point of view on skilling and just pick up from that context. Uh, so maybe I'll start with, uh, uh, yes, sir, the first question that I have is that while we talk a lot about skilling from AICT, UGC, sort of um, educational institution, learning platforms, etc. How does skilling play a role from an industry perspective? You can share some views on that and then we'll start and keep the panel as interactive as we can. Thank you, Mayank, and uh, Namaskar. I had an opportunity to talk to some of the real great Star Wars today. Then I realized that uh, I am not a um, skill man, I am novice. But I also observed two things. Uh, Sarkar ko kuch aur karna chahiye aur jobs kahan par hain. I got a little confused in the morning. I think uh, plane se bahar dekhenge to clouds jada dikhai dete hain. We will have to come down to chopper view. We will have to come down to chopper view. So, uh, Mayank, uh, you talked about the industry and the relevant areas. I uh, come from metal industry and within metal also steel. There is another dilemma that I am from stainless steel. So there is always a confusion. He is stainless steel kya hai, steel kya hai. On the lighter side, I was making my home. So I said, I have a gate. Banwane. She said, I have a steel gate. I have a stainless steel gate. I have a stainless steel gate. So my point here is for uh, such category, which is still at a nascent stage of category recognition, the challenges are different. People will, from auto will uh, realize what happened in 80s in escorts. That today, auto is something different. So now coming back to the topic, I think uh, instead of depending too much on somebody else to do, uh, industry who are the leaders, they have to come forward. We have to realize what is the ecosystem. Uh, another word was the relevant area. So I think uh, the ecosystem should be relevant to the industry where you operate. Because if you look at the vision for that industry, the leaders have to own that. I bring my experiences from the stainless steel industry. You know, you as consumer uses stainless steel or experiences stainless steel. Uses means bartan, pipe and tubes. Experience means Mande Bharat, Shatabdi, malls. It is totally different than what we make. That means between that and me, there is a huge ecosystem. And unfortunately, that ecosystem is primarily of MSME. And like all of us know, scaling is one of the most different challenges among MSME. You would have also noticed a lot that when we talk about scaling, most of the discussions unfortunately are 
at the time of induction or during the induction. A company which is $4 billion, $5 billion like mine, 25,000 employees, I think all of us are really equipped to handle that scaling part for the new joinees. So I will not talk about that. So the challenge is twofold. One is awareness and the scaling at the academia level. And the second is at the ecosystem external environment level. Coming to the first one, two years, 78 polytechnics, Haryana and Odisha, each polytechnic is having a stainless steel course with different degrees of uh, skilling inputs given to them. 10 engineering institutes, ITI clusters in process. So I believe that that should be the ownership, right nipping at the bud for the students to know and to get skilled even before coming to the industry. I think somewhere the question came to me, if premium doge, jada salary doge, I think pre-skilled employees will definitely fetch uh, something better than the others. The downstream MSME ecosystem, uh, professors have talked about some 700 courses and all. For stainless steel, there are only three qualification packs specific to stainless steel and we got them made. And here I would like to say, I have quite encouraging experience from the government, whether it is NSGC, Capital Council, uh, Indian Arena Steel, Steel Sector Council, in two years, we have been able to create a qualification pack for the fabrication and you would be observing lots of stainless steel gates and grills. We have already trained 40,000 people or you have a young warrior concept in our film. And I will request you to please scan the QR code on the souvenir booklet in our ad. You will see how we are trying to uh, take care of the societal junk through the scaling initiative. We have also developed kitchenware uh, qualification pack. This has a potential to change the life of more than 20 lakh employees. Just now in September, NCVT has approved a heavy fabrication stainless steel pack, qualification pack. You know, what is the importance? You might have heard Honorable uh, Gadkarji speaking, ki corrosion uh, ki wajah se desh mein itna nuksan ho hai. This heavy fabrication will help in changing the landscape of the country, footover bridges, railway bridges, infrastructure, so that we are going to have the sustainable uh, solutions. Um, I have been told three to four minutes. So I have some more views. I hope I get more chance. Uh, so I believe that uh, instead of cribbing, industry leaders need to own it. And it is beyond the CSR. I believe that CSR to me is more like a commitment, more like a compliance. It should be a commitment. That are my initial views. Thank you. Thank you for the initial views. Uh, so just maybe picking up on that, Mubdesh, uh, from your side, because you have seen uh, industry across spectrum, right? Uh, uh, how is industry leading the way in skilling? Uh, because everybody thinks that skilling is a problem of the institutions and universities and education, IT, and so on and so forth. But where does industry come and play an important role in leading skilling? Some examples of that would be very helpful. Hi, good morning. Good morning, all. Thank you.
third party industry trading partners are there and then uh, whatever a skill a student or employee wanted to learn like he wanted to be expert in CNC machine or maybe wanted to use code in uh, uh, Python or uh, wanted to uh, maybe algorithm in the, uh, uh, the logistics. So all are available and government is very, uh, or uh, the partners or uh, the technical institutes are very friendly to the industry. That's what uh, we have seen across in my last 23, 24 years of time. In the flexible learning industry also now using the NAPS, government has created a very good uh, scheme through in this uh, budget also the kind of support and the finances to the uh, MSM industries or good to the industries. But the challenges is, challenge is that in the organized sector, there are only uh, the 8 to 9 percent people work in the organized sector, or it's only 10 percent. So, uh, not more than 50 millions in, uh, across the industry. Rest, rest 80 percent work in the unorganized sector. So there is a big challenge. So, the unorganized sector may be 50 percent in uh, the agriculture economy. So, agriculture or maybe your other small, 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 small construction areas, small, small areas, where the more focus or detailing required because they don't know, they are not aware about their skills or skill set. But the time to come in the last four, five, six years or ten years, the smartphone or e commerce or everything has come up. If we partner with them, like if you see uh, one model when I used to study in 98, 99, we got to know about a very good scheme of uh, ITC called e Chopal. So e Chopal, through e Chopal now also they are covering more than 35,000 places and more than 4 uh, million people uh, uh, on in agriculture they are trained in the, uh, the agriculture, farming, how to use seeds, chemicals, pesticides. So that is our, then uh, another model, a model come, if you have heard about that, Hindustan in Unilever, that Sakti, Sakti, Sakti. So for, mainly for the women. So industry is trying to do, trying to do a lot and government or the institutes are always supportive. Only the thing is that which I face or I think the challenges uh, from the side, if you see uh, the population of uh, US is, 33 crores, same, so 33 crores, and same population we have from 18 years to 35 years, approx. And the scope is very limited because large scale industry only 5 million uh, job. Rest, how to create the employment model or maybe the self sustainable model or how to train this small scale industries or on my sector. There need to be more focus, mainly the, uh, the learning by learning, one thing. And then make people more uh, socially accountable, even students also. If they are at the age of 14 to 18 years, so how make them more accountable during their vocational training, IDA program, diploma program, or maybe in 10th and 12th, that how you are going to have skills. How would you have initiated a scheme like I think four, five years back, I have heard about that Atal uh, tinkering labs, tinkering labs. But exhibition is very low. So that need to think how industry can come out, how an industry and academy both can uh, have the tie up and then uh, do the things in better. So that's how very good model examples are there of this. Thank you so much. No, so thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot. I think what you mentioned uh, was about uh, how there is one part of the organized sector, but what one can do in an unorganized sector that is equally important and how to integrate learning with working uh, could sort of create some unique opportunities for people to come together and get skilled in the process. Uh, just moving to Sima, just Sima, I think you guys see to a different vantage point uh, and maybe you guys do reports on skilling, future of jobs, so on and so forth. Sure. Uh, you also offer programs uh, where you have this EY certification, some of the things to skill up people for accounting, finance, so on and so forth. So, from your vantage point, and I'm not asking as a vantage point of the industry, but also as an industry observer from the outside, what models are you sort of seeing emerging in the context of industry participation in the context of skilling right now? Yeah, thanks Mike. So first is, uh, I would definitely like to draw on the report first because that gives insights as well. So first thanks to a lot to the Fiki team, uh, the EY team, and of course, uh, we have a host of learners, trainers, and industry participants who have given feedback. So I think that's also going to lead into the question that you have asked. 
is when we are looking at the skilling itself, and from a, from a vantage point you're saying not as an industry but an observer, is that there is definitely, and we have spoken about it, there is definitely a need for the industry and the training institutes to collaborate. And both of them have mentioned explicitly in the report that the industry says, I wish I had these courses already there. Sir has already mentioned it took two years to get a QP. But then industry says, I want skilled, qualified workforce now, and we may not have it. So that's why. The feedback from the trainers is very clear that we want the industry to come and tell us what should we train the students on because we want them to be employed, meaningfully employed. So there is, of course, a need. And I think that's well established. But what's more interesting that came out is the learners said that we want on the job training. So they have realized that sitting in the classroom only is not sufficient getting a hands-on working environment, looking at how this trade eventually translates into the job on the ground is extremely important for students. So if you were to see what would we see as coming together is really, and hopefully with this budget with internship getting so much of focus, I would really love to see students taking internship and therefore they're realizing what it means to get into the job force, not only from technical skills but also from people skills. I think the next thing that we definitely should look at, keeping again the pivot of uh, international mobility, is to see if internship can now be expanded to the international market. There is a need, people eventually go there, but should they not see what it means to go there and work? And it could be like a student exchange program, why don't we have an internship exchange program, which will allow skilled workforce from here and other countries as well to come over and see the magic of India and how the students from India can go and see how it is to live in our countries. Well, the internship part is very interesting and I think that's a, it's a, I think when the platform gets released, we we'll see some interesting movement of how to integrate internships and I think the CSR budget is also can be used for funding that internship place. So it's, a, it's an interesting plan to sort of think about it. And I think international community you mentioned that, but it's a very interesting thing because, uh, and this is with something LSDC does a lot of work for, which is about the talent mobility. And I think today, uh, while we can say it's kind, sometimes people say it's a brain drain, but in very interesting way, people who are living abroad, they send about 125 million worth of remittance back to the country. So in some ways, sort of as the economy also as well, sort of going, uh, into the ecosystem. So I'm mean, just moving to you on perhaps um, one, another view from the industry and then we have your presence of the from the other aspect which is while industry is participating, uh, are, are you seeing certain success stories coming out in terms of uh, successful execution of those skilling programs? And I think uh, you guys also work a lot with state government and government sort of uh, relationship. If you can just talk about because I think we have a lot of industry here uh, but if you can bring in the, uh, the, the viewpoint of the relationship and partnership with the government and how industry and government can come together and create more success stories in the process. Uh, so, uh, with a skill gap of around 64%, we are only sec second to Japan, which has around 81% skill gap. Uh, at the level of uh, 3 and 4, we have only 11% uh, skills, uh, people with that skill set. So this has a, this is, creates a big, big, uh, you know, appetite and, and uh, scope for the youth to, you know, be skilled and then add to the, uh, the demographic dividend uh, professor was talking about. If it has to, you know, if it has to realize itself, then it has to be skill first, skill always. Coming to what at Mahindra, we, we have recognized it quite early and uh, that is why one of our success stories, in fact two of them, uh, one is uh, Mahindra High School. Uh, around in eight years, we have skilled uh, close to three lakh and above uh, students. Uh, we have tied up with Delhi skill uh, an entrepreneurship university and we are uh, across 19 states we are skilling uh, vocational training we are giving vocational training for uh, around 90 hours uh, in life skills in aptitude skills and in language skills which we are talking about because English always you know becomes the only uh, language of transmission or and then it becomes a 
you know, limitation for other people in other uh, vernaculars. So this is where uh, Pride School has, is, has done and achieved. The other is uh, Tech Mahindra's skill for market uh, technology. So uh, that training has around, around again, uh, 1 lakh uh, 68,000 something we have achieved. And that, again, we are uh, skilling people, uh, you know, children for uh, uh, logistics, digital uh, appetite, and digital training, so that they, they are future ready. So it is more about keeping the skill set future ready, because this is a changing environment. What was uh, pertinent, say, five years ago is now getting obsolete or already uh, obsolete. So what what the environment is changing, uh, we have to change the course curriculum accordingly. And that is where uh, the industry comes into play because uh, if, if uh, say, digital technology or any uh, semiconductor uh, organization, they would want a different kind of a skill set rather than a manufacturing uh, company or a, say, a service delivery company. So this, this course curriculum has to change accordingly. Uh, coming to states, if uh, I would say, I would like to lord uh, state government of Telangana, the new chief minister there, he, he has recognized this and they are coming up with a, a Young India Skill University, uh, which Anand Mahindra is one of the board members chairing that uh, board and they, they have recognized this and this is where, you know, state governments have to come up, look to the future work backwards, partner with industries, and then, uh, you know, create a pool of skilled people uh, who are, you know, ready to uh, get absorbed. Unless you, you those skills are suitable, they will not make you employable. And if they are, you are not employable, then the skill, you know, loses whatever skilling that has been done is, you know, loses its sheen, and then it does not serve its purpose. So, here you have to work with the industry, with the course curriculum, whoever prepares it, the, the uh, institutions, and of course the government. Government also has to come in where a lot of funding is required. You know, I'm just giving an example of uh, future skill in uh, Singapore. So Singapore has come up with this. Uh, they, they, what they do, they give 500 same dollars to each and every person who is ready to skill, upskill, you know, reskill themselves and then uh, it is a lifelong process till they are in the workforce. So they can upgrade their skills, they can change, uh, you know, linearly into uh, some other industry which is suitable, they may upgrade themselves. So this, at the end of the day, they are employable, always employable. So rich dividends have been, uh, you know, reaped by the industry, DBS Bank has come up and said that uh, around 3.3% skill upgradation has happened uh, through this program. So these are some of the programs which can, uh, there are a lot of examples, good examples which can be emulated. So you don't have to reinvent this to be. We can follow that also and, you know, uh, 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 reap benefits in this Amrit Kar. So just, uh, uh, I think you mentioned about uh, APAR, uh, ABC. Uh, sometimes I feel that not many people are aware of it and I feel genuinely that if APAR and ABC get executed really well, it could be like a UPI moment that happened in payments. Education will have the similar kind of platform that has been built. Now, everybody has an ask from the government, saying, okay, please fund, get us something more, get us more skill, power, talent. I think you are in a unique position right now that you can ask the industry. So if you had an ask from the industry in terms of how to bridge the skill gap, just what are your sort of top level asks coming from the industry perspective that, look, these are the areas where you feel industry has not walked the talk so far and there's more work that needs to be done in the process. See, all the panelists themselves have spoken about it, but they have been executed. And it is Amit, uh, Siva, both of them said that internship is very important. The ICT created an internship portal where there are now already 76,000 industries on board. But we have million. So our student strength in the higher education itself is about 4.5 crores. In school education, another 25 crores. Those who are in the skill sector in terms of vocational education, ITI, 
we are all put together. Another core point though, with such huge population, the number of students who are onboarded on the platform is already 20 million. To, uh, we are able to provide actual internship through this portal to about only 50 lakh in the four years. Over four years. The government this time has announced through the finance ministry's uh, you know, budget that there will be one crore not it is internship, it is actually apprenticeship permitted program. But this number is too small compared to the real student population. So my appeal to all the industry friends is by 76,000 it should become multiple, you know, maybe three, four times so that all our students will get that opportunity. Second thing which uh, often we are talking about is curriculum being outdated. So the participation of the industry in the Senate, academic councils has to be important. And it should be specifically not for a particular industry, but it should be agnostic. But otherwise, uh, the student will be able to get employed only in uh, maybe steel industry or in the auto industry or something like that. It's not good enough. So they have to have a variety of skill sets, including the communication skills. The attitude and aptitude of the students has to be continuously upgraded. And then finally, we have to make students realize that whatever they learn in the college or the university or any place is not good enough and they have to keep learning. That lifelong learning is a very important concept. Therefore, it is not just skilling but reskilling, upskilling, which Amit said is very important. And we have to drive this home both in the educational institutions and the industry. And give support. You know. Whatever government requires to do, government will do. But the industry also has to pitch in to do that. If we do that as a team, you know, if we are a team. You know, if we work as a team, I'm sure we will be able to succeed in our efforts to get the true demographic debate in doctor. So this is a very important point that you mentioned. Because I think this is one of the first, this budget at least, uh, got us to talk about education and skills in a very sort of similar line. So. I think uh, there has always been a division uh, between education and skills and I think this time we are seeing a lot many more conversation happening where skills is being given the same level of sort of weightage as what the, uh, the, uh, the education system has had. Uh, I think we have just limited time so I mean, just a quick one question and then we will uh, wrap it up for any Q&A coming from the audience. Uh, Kuruja, just starting from your side because uh, uh, if Jindal does something they do it big. Uh, so how do you see scalable model emerging in skilling between industry and uh, 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 and participation from sort of academic company? Are there scalable opportunities that can be created in the process? I refer to uh, three QPs and uh, believe me, these three QPs have got nothing to do with the employees. This is all downstream. And I think uh, we should look into the multi-employment multiplier factor for each uh, industry which is uh, about uh, seven in case of steel and stainless steel. So that is uh, the employment generation possibilities uh, which are around us. And when I talk about the downstream, there are millions and millions of people. So hence the scalability and sustainability becomes uh, very, very uh, critical. Uh, what are uh, our views? Uh, first of all is the vision, the focus. In fact, we have created a dedicated uh, department called Stainless Academy that they have to work on the category recognition and they have to ensure the scaling and upscaling specifically for the downstream. People like me and Mahindras, uh, we can spend a lot on our employees. But the MSME ke jo clusters hai, who will take care of them? Unke paas to voice bhi nahi hai. So we have, uh, apart from the focus, we have four themes that uh, it has to be absolutely market and demand led. And I think that the government is very, very open to that. Whatever we have proposed, uh, they have not said no. But we have to be specific, we have to help them so that they are able to help us. Long term perspective, uh, like in my case, uh, from 4.5 million tons of stainless steel in after Nirvar Kal, it will come to uh, reach 20 million tons. So, look to change downstream. Ke liye. Third is the people like us, we absolutely have to take the ownership of the ecosystem, the external ecosystem, which is after the product what you make specifically in the B2B environment. And of course, like I said, uh, it is not compliance. It has to be commitment. In fact, uh, we are partnered with PwC, uh, sorry. <laughs> and we are working on this uh, scalability model. Uh, to us, uh, there are uh, five areas. 
because all of us are in bits and pieces, some structured, some more structured, we are doing something for this aspect because this is very, very critical, all of us recognize it. But I think for the scaling of the operations, the words which should come to the mind is need analysis, delivery models. In fact, we on our own has, are doing a TNA pan-India basis covering 250 companies in 10 different segments, 1,000 independent fabricators and 500 students from academia, right from ITIs up to the postgrads and we have got many programs going on to really understand ki scaleless steel ki cutting recognition ke liye to generate the employment, uh, what exactly is required. So this is our own initiative. So the first focus area is the scale of the current operations, multiple things, curriculum, QPs, digital matrix, SOPs, SLAs. Second is the expanding offerings. We are talking a lot about the evolving. We are talking IR 4.0, but you would have got a glimpse of IR 5.0 in movies like Terminator and, uh, and, 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 and yeah, one more movie was there, and Terminator, etc. So uh, the things are so evolving. Just to give a small example of the applications, 25 years ago, if stainless steel was seen, then the burden used to be 80 percent. That 20 percent others today is 65 percent. And what is that? Others architecture, building construction, automobile, railway transport, process, industry. And the things which have changed so quickly, the evolving aero, uh, aerospace, defense, uh, green economy, infrastructure focus. And believe in me, next five years you will see the blue economy in a big way. So apart from this AI data and all those things, all these things are changing. So that evolving thing. Third is the project monitoring. That is very critical. It has to be very, very continued digital tool certifications, of course, governing structure. I am getting that view from you. And the last one is, of course, the, uh, of course, the partnerships. Like I said, great support from Haryana government, great support from Odisha government, where we have the plants, whether it is NSDC, capital goods. Uh, I am reasonably okay, but we will be funds, we will be more motivated, we will be able to multiply in a better way. Thank you. No, but I think the partnership and coming together every day. Community is one way that we are sort of one can scale up these initiatives. You mentioned one point that look things are changing very rapidly. I think uh, while we look at even for youth, steel industry has changed so rapidly, revolution has happened. So Sina, maybe I'd love to sort of touch upon this one point because lifelong learning was something that Ramit mentioned. That how should organizations and industry tackle this issue of constant skill obsolescence uh, and new skills coming up? Uh, while there's a fair bit of change happening in steel industry, which in some form people will see it's a very steady industry, but look at what's happening on AI, look at what's happening on sort of data, security, so on and so forth. How should industry, government, academia come together and strategize just to solve for the constant change and obsolescence of skill sets? What is my second answer? Uh, I had an opportunity to meet a vice chancellor of a very, very big university and the students of energy economics something very close to my heart. He said, I don't get a job for my children. I was very surprised because I had gone there only because my AG sustainable officer said, Sharma ji, I don't get a job for my children. So when I interacted with those people, I found that while the course is good, but they are not having the exposure of what is happening around. They were not aware about CBAM. So green is something which is so important. So my left hand is not knowing what my right hand needs. So now we are working on that. So my point here is I think there should be such forums, there should be more interaction of industry with the right stakeholders and they are willing, my man is willing, we are spending time with them, course is being modified, I am very sure we will be able to bridge the gaps. So, and this is true in many areas, but I believe it has to be strictly industry specific. Apne badi badi na karein, jo mera ecosystem hai, can I contribute? It is a give back from a company like me to the society that we are doing our bit. Let me tell you my perspective. First is we have a very vested interest in ensuring the people who join us are well qualified and skills and skilled here. So what can we do? When the industry or technology changes, typically it's either the academic institute or the industry that gets impacted most. Sometimes if it's more scientific, then of course like AI or quantum comes from academic institutions, but like cybersecurity is more industry. And I think there are a couple of things that we should do. First is industry definitely creates courses and it's out there in the market. So the ecosystem exists. 
can we have a formal recognition of the trainings that happen outside of the curriculum? And it could be as small as micro we were discussing with Sir as well, on the validity and the acceptance of micro -credentials. So can I take a small course that makes me fit for this particular job that I need to do? This need not necessarily come from training institutes, need not necessarily be linked to NSQF, but then is recognized by the industry and if the learner takes it, then he or she gets value both within the organization and outside the organization. I think that's extremely critical because I don't think the curriculum and the awarding bodies can move as fast as the technology is awarded. The fast paced change happening today, I think every day you wake up and you see something absolutely new coming. I think none of the panel can get over without talking about AI uh, because I think everybody has to talk about AI before they get up from the panel. So maybe Amit, I'd love to sort of get your perspective, views on. Uh, are you guys seeing usage of AI in skilling, reskilling, and sort of uh, creating the workforce of tomorrow? Not just training them on technical aspects, but just usage of AI on sort of learning, like, I mean, learning, training, and skilling overall. And are these trends, opportunities that, at least from my group perspective, you guys are witnessing and uh, sort of seeing at this point in time? So that is one very, you know, pertinent question. Uh, and AI is here to stay. AI can be very disruptive, but then how you harness it, it's like fire. So at Mahindra, and of course Tech Mahindra is doing a lot of work on AI, generative AI. And, uh, this is one tool that helps you what, what is the need of the future, what you have in your kitty, how you can upgrade it in a way uh, so that it can be suitable to you in the coming when the need arises in the near future. So, uh, again, uh, my favorite uh, country right now is, of course, Singapore. How they are using uh, AI, if, if you have certain kind of a skill, they have a website, My Skill, uh, My Future Skill, where you punch in what you are doing right now, and then it gives you a full training kind of, uh, or a pathway from where you can, you know, pick up upskill yourself, upgrade yourself in a way so that you are suitable to the uh, industry. So even if because of certain uh, technological changes or due to market change, some strategy change, you lose a job in one place, you are readily employable for any other industry, any other uh, organization. So this is where you, that keeps you, you know, pertinent to the industry all throughout. So through data, and the analytics will throw up a lot of, you know, uh, surprises for you, which which you can then, you know, accommodate yourself, acclimatize yourself, so to make yourself future ready. So here AI becomes very very important. AI is also, you know, industry agnostic. If you want to make it, then then it serves a purpose. So here it is a big tool, very important tool, which we need to harness so that uh, we. Everyone uh, who is in the uh, workforce is future ready. So that is that is where I would. So more around personalization, giving the right data, and sort of making it sort of much more personal for that individual. Uh, maybe Pune I think you want to add something, but I just maybe add a question for you also. Just given that your diverse background, uh, uh, we said that India is the youngest population. We said that India is the largest youth population. Um, uh, and a lot of conversation was happening is about Indian talent in India. Uh, but we are seeing an emergence of Indian talent being deployed internationally. And there is enough sort of traction that we are seeing where Indians are going. In technology, we have seen enough of those. Uh, but even outside technology, healthcare, we are seeing an emergence of this. Hospitality, we are seeing an emergence of this. So in a lot of skills spaces, we are seeing Indians going abroad. Just your views that as India as a country, if you have such a large population, how do we leverage that, not just for the Indian economy, but also supporting the global economy that becomes a very strong bridge for Indian skilled workers looking at opportunities internationally? So, thanks for uh, very good, interesting, interesting question. So we see, uh, we see the, the kind of uh, first, a skill, the rate of 
shops we can do very fast so and uh, if we work on uh, first the benchmark the competency or skill model of is competency or skill model of the uh, foreign or worldwide like uh, dual skill system of germany like i said uh, singapore future skill and then korean also dual skill system america canada everywhere so first we need to we need to take uh, uh, their kind of advantage their kind of benchmark and then put some interesting customized part of india as well then it can be more global skill and then maybe by another 2 3 years or 4 year you, you will see by 2030 maybe 25% of world skill population is maybe from india definitely because the scope india is limited now but in future uh, uh, numbers increasing so skill set based on the that ai also through ai we can predict the need of skill predict the need of training and through uh, ai or many other uh, system, system we can train our people in the each way but uh, same time if we can have a tie up with uh, not with the technical uh, institute or apprentice or the training program or guiding them but in the formal education as well to middle school or intermediate college, colleges if industry uh, support them even we see the school colleges and industries like uh, water and oil they cannot meet earlier but now we need to think of uh, like that like uh, uh, the uh, peanut we can make uh, peanut and jam together and then if we support schools industry support schools with the help of government and and school education and then the skill can be initiated from there because from age 4, 5 to 18, the another 25 to 30 crore population is available. So how to make them trend so that when they become 16 year old or 18 year old, they, they may be more employable, more skilled so that uh, in the world like uh, Singapore, they have the future skills at, at the age of 19, after 12, they can go to any country and work and world demand our skills. So that way we can, I think, support them. Thank you. No, I think this uh, uh, play of AI plus also sort of figuring out how Indian talent can be different that would be a huge opportunity. So I think you have been now in academia for the last what, uh, 30 years, 40 years, 40 years, yeah. So let's, I'm putting you in a time machine and I'm sending you back that you are age of 30, 35 years old. And you are now thinking, knowing all that you know about skills, education and sort of uh, what's happening in employability, employment. And you said India is a startup nation and a lot of startups coming in. There are many entrepreneurs and sort of aspiring entrepreneurs out here. So, what would Professor Sarasabode, 35 year old, start and see opportunities within the skilling, education, and sort of getting the Indian talent up in the global map? What are the areas that you would advise an aspiring entrepreneur today to sort of look at? Uh, and potentially everybody can take notes and start that venture in the coming few years. Going back in time machine, okay. So I think there are four or five areas which are very significant and important for creating startups as well as growing economy. Starting from right now, we discussed about AI. And India is likely to be the AI capital of the world. And therefore, we should indulge in doing a lot of uh, activities in AI helping our population, both personalized learning to even industry. Everything is possible through that. The second point is about energy transition. So today from the present oil industry, which is working on the energy sector, we need to move on. And therefore, the energy transition is going to become a very relevant point. How do we engage in that? Sustainability is another third one. It's not only the United Nations, but India is committed to that. Therefore, we must move ahead with that. And lastly, in the last couple of years, we have get got into the semiconductor industry in a big way. We always felt that we missed the bus in the hardware, but for the first time we are entering into that domain. So from the upstream to downstream, you know, it's a huge market which is going to be available for both environment as well as for talent pool to be created for 
creating the startups and therefore huge obligations are available in that domain. I think these are four very important critical areas where our startups can start working and there is huge opportunity not only in India, worldwide. Uh, I mean, touching on all the four projects, AI first talent pool will be in India. I, I, do, I don't believe in technical talent, but all the talent that supports the industry will come from India. Energy transition, whether it goes into nuclear, solar, wind, uh, green energy, there's a and battery, lithium ion batteries, etc. There's sort of huge potential there. Sustainability as well as semiconductor are just two very significant streams. So, uh, for anybody taking note, these are interesting areas sort of want to get in. Uh, I just want to leave the last question before we open up our audience. Uh, uh, and we saw, I'll start with you, uh, that everybody says there's a skill gap. Uh, so the industry on that side says educational institutions are not teaching. Educational institutions are teaching and saying, look, I'm teaching, but look, salary of a graduate engineer is not increasing. So you are not paying us more. Uh, so is that, uh, where do you see the owners on right now? Is it that the people are not skilled enough and that educational institutions are not getting them right, ready, ready right now? Or is there a wage problem and wage premium problem? And how does that conundrum get solved? Because you are saying, NHGC is saying, AICT is saying we are skilling people. Industry is saying they are not skilled people. But when it comes to giving wage premium, there is not that much of wage premium available either. So do you see this conundrum as a chicken and egg problem? And how do you see it sort of solving for that? I think we need to work together. You know, I was saying whatever skilling is happening in the educational institutions certainly is not good enough. So blaming uh, industry is not right. But at the same time, if an institution is providing excellent skill sets, is the industry ready to catch up and then get higher pay packages to them? Is also a question. So I think uh, we need to sit together, work together. Part of the responsibility of the industry is also to skill students when they are in the college and universities, and then pick them up. So you say that, you know, I want to pick up 100 people for the uh, steel industry. Chabaji is there, and therefore I am willing to put in my uh, eggs into your college basket. Please come forward, who is willing to take the course? And if they do it, they should respect the learning by the students and then give them better practice. Both are important. So I think we, sh we should have not just once in a year kind of a seminar, but I, I repeatedly said that it is partnership between them. So industry and academia truly we should should become partners, partners not in crime, but partners in developing India. So I think that's a, that's a tricky one, but I'll, I'll tell you what, uh, from multiple perspectives, and I think industry definitely says they want more relevant skills and are they willing to pay a premium. But I would like to put it also the other way that the initiatives that have been taken, and I want to highlight, let's say, uh, how do platforms really solve this problem? And, and the first example I would like to take is the Skill India Digital, which is, of course, uh, from the Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship, very much based on uh, future skills of Singapore, taking from ONET of uh, the US. Because the reason why I'm bringing this together is platforms will be the only way you can democratize information and access to information and access to skilling. So if I say that I need a specific skill in a specific geography, and it's going to be that specific, because if you're going to talk about uh, women labor force participation, you cannot start expecting them to move across district, across states. They do, but they obviously the numbers are less. So if I were to give localized jobs, with localized skills, I need that information. Do the boys and girls know exactly where they can get the skills and if they get skill or take a few more QPs or a few more courses, what's the delta that they will get for their jobs? And I think that information is missing. And therefore, your question is, is the industry paying premium is because there is an asymmetry and therefore you do not get this information spread to the learners, the trainers and therefore the employers. So yes, we definitely give a premium to those who are skilled. So like Sir has said, there is, of course, a handshake that has to happen. Can we proactively go to the skilling and education institutions and start saying these are the kind of skills the industry wants? Predominantly, all surveys unilaterally say 21st century skills and soft skills, most important, the rest we can teach. If you can bring that, and I think that will be very powerful. You heard academia, consultancy, industry perspective also. 
I, I, I talked about the 78 polytechnics, 100% in Odisha and uh, Chajpur. Out of that, three in Chajpur district, one in Hisar. In addition to the fifth semester compulsory course, there is an option of elective course. And there we have a commitment to take minimum 50% of the students who go to the elective course. And we are doing it. So, yes, we are responsible, we are sensitive towards it. Yeah, so this marriage has to happen. It has not been, this marriage has been quite stained for some time. Now it has to, you know, be more benign. And uh, they were there, but it's not about you know, holding your fork. It is coming together for a larger good. And then here both are, you know, benefiting. So I'll just, like you have certain credits, as uh, Shrivas has said that, uh, what kind of a skill set you want? Uh, I'll just give you an example. Anyone searching for a job on LinkedIn, uh, if there is a job uh, advertisement, if you go, punch yourself there, and then you run an AI uh, on that platform, it will tell you that these are the skill set, four skill sets you have, three skills you are missing. So if you have certain kinds of examples, you can quote into your CV and then you know enrich your CV uh, according to the job. So this is one example I'm just giving you. So this is how you will make yourself pertinent to the industry. Industry will go back like we are partnering with uh, Ministry of Skill Development on the entrepreneurship uh, building. We are already there. So uh, here we have gone up, suggested them courses because uh, only two years ago uh, we graduated from BS4 to BS6. That was a big leap. We didn't go for BS5. So a lot of engine change, a lot of uh, you know, fuel change has taken place. So there, there you need to uh, upgrade the skills of the ITI guys, the uh, uh, polytechnic guys who, who will be on the shop floor. So we have made that uh, suggested those changes in the course curriculum. Uh, when accepted and inculcated because then there is a board, it will go to the board, that board will approve how open that board is to change, that will also depend, you know. Uh, so, so these kind of uh, bottlenecks are there, but if they are taken care of, I think, you know, uh, uh, we, we, we are there to deliver. Same, the so industry is always open. If a skill set is available, then they are always open to give extra training. So, no issues. And then, they can have tie up with the institute also, that how it can be upgraded through AI or the trick. Thank you. So the trick question, so that's the reason why that everybody comes to the same page. Uh, that's why this question was asked. So look, with this, we come to the end of the panel discussion. I'll just open it up for any questions from the audience. Uh, you can raise your hand and then we ask a question who it is addressed to. Point to the point which uh, Ms. Tamil Chekhar in about, raised about future skills of Singapore. I just want to share with everyone that we at, uh, firstly that technology now is more of a horizontal requirement across sector skills, ac across all sectors whether it's steel or whether it's automotive. And we at uh, the IT, ITA sector skills council have taken a leaf out of the skills future of Singapore and we've created the Future Skills Prime platform, which has courses in emerging technologies. We have the full courses also, we have micro credentials also. We have courses on soft skills also. We have 1.8 million learners on the platform. We have financial benefits from the government uh, to all the 
uh, uh, learners who uh, take these courses. And the best part is that in the European Commission's Pact for Skills report of 2023, we were right on top, along with Future Skills Singapore, in the top three best practices globally in scaling our ecosystem. Thank you. Um, it was a very enlightening discussion right since morning. A few points uh, which uh, I think uh, I jotted down and I was very interested in. Um, I wanted to know. Uh, industries to come in, and the MSME sector is a very, very broad thing. 
exchange programs and the internship programs and on-the-job credit, which happens abroad, which is not happening in India. So on-the-job credit means you give the ch uh, child a chance to work and that credit could be in and then you uh, uh, go ahead with your studies. There are many more points, but I will uh, uh, thank you so much. Sir, I have a very simple question and a direct question to Professor Anil Sahastrabhudhe sir. Country has education system and evaluation system of education very well established. But country lacks very much the evaluation of skilling system because skill is the training and we everybody has been telling last 10, 15 years, skill development, skill development, millions of people being skilled. But once when you go to the international forum, where are you? Nowhere. I, we have been visiting the engineering colleges, the students undertaking undergraduate program. They shy of going into the workshops. They are undergoing B.Tech mechanical. They don't do any kind of machining or welding. So why the new generation is running away from the basics? Because these are very essential. Last two weeks I was in France. There was a world skill competition where we have seen the skills where our university and engineering colleges could have brought glory to the nation, which has been missing. Because in our country, the skilling means it is the work of the ITIs and the 10, 12 or somewhere diploma people. There are skill manufacturing team challenge, there is AI, there are uh, industrial automation, so many skills are there where our graduate engineers, the qualified, the brains, if they are motivated to take up those areas, that will bring quality jobs to the country, that will also provide highly paid employment to the youth of the country, not only in the country, but also beyond, and will uh, provide, uh, will attract the companies to the country, which is not there. Because the skilling, the precision, the high-tech skilling is not happening. We are doing basic skilling. So we must also look towards high-tech skilling and should motivate our young minds who are going to the engineering colleges. Of course, we are doing very good in computer science, IT, and those software areas that is undoubtedly good. But the other production technology, manufacturing sciences, mechanical engineering are lagging behind. Our engineers are nowhere when we compare in the international scene. Thank you. Briefly answer this in order to create that uh, impression on the students that there are challenges and opportunities in sectors beyond computer science is a very important thing. Today, many of the engineering schools are stopping or closing all disciplines other than computer science. And it is a tragic thing. And therefore, we must have these hardware hackathons where students from uh, high schools, if they start working on some of the problems and find solutions to them, that is more exciting than even getting high money, actually, I'm telling you. So that is what is required to be created. It's a slow process, you know, parents, relatives, friends, there is so much of pressure that everyone wants to gravitate towards uh, computer science and IT. So we have to come out of that uh, syndrome. Okay, thank you. Well, sir, thank you. Questions. Maybe just a last two questions and then we close the panel. Yes. So I have, uh, uh, this is A.L. Narsimhan from representing the Pramash equation, uh, the people who are uh, into CCTV surveillance technology. I have a very optimistic view on this. Uh, based, I mean, mine is limited to the surveillance technology that we are uh, involved in. There has been a lot of interaction between uh, my organization and the institution. And more so with uh, some of these universities like uh, Jitkara University, Chandigarh, or uh, the Goa, Goa, the Goa uh, Engineering Colleges, which are there. I see a lot of sync uh, happening uh, in terms of uh, the skilling that they want to do for their students and what their expectation on their industry is all about. Well, uh, an institution definitely looks for some financial help, no doubt about it, because at the end of the day, that is what uh, I mean, their purpose is. 
but thereupon the their concern for the students to learn the skill and be relevant in the market is also visible so we have come across and we have been sort of supporting them that that's the reason why we are scaling partners as well as uh, with nsdc we have been doing a lot of work with uh, many universities and uh, and uh, you know there is new subject which has cropped up in the university called the safety and security uh, you know uh, ap apart from the ecs and uh, in the other engineering uh, you know disciplines that you have more so relevant because of the kind of security challenges the country is facing today and uh, apart from what we are facing there at the borders so in the homeland security as well so these universities want to skill their students in terms of how to be you know aware of uh, the technology which is available there in the market that can be relevant and make this country secure so the purpose being the atmanirbhar bharat or surakshit bharat or whatever it is many of the universities institutions have come forward talking to us that you know while we teach the theory how would you be able to help us in terms of making it you know relevant and how to make the ensure that the students get their you know practical training hands on training on these products and technologies we are going about doing it as a, as a csr initiative as a, as, a, as a, you know in con in consultation with these universities we have ensured that you know this these these technologies are the which is the updated technology is there available for the students to learn we are very happy to tell you there are more than 10000 students who have gone through this process many of them have 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 gone into self self employment doing very well in there in the country there are many who have been absorbed by the industry and many who have been absorbed by our own organizations so i think it is quite relevant that there is lot of work which is going on between the industry and the industry. thank you my job Last question. I have just one different. Uh, I think all the questions were first row, so I'm sorry for the mic not reaching. Yeah, but after that, yeah. Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, and that the mic finally reached. Now, after having worked for 20 years on writing on reforms, I can only sum it up in two ways. The last gentleman who spoke uh, made all the points clear. two things that i have been writing uh, over the last 10 years at least that the skill india mission should be taken up completely by the industry each and every person should be trained according to an an industry skill second thing i would say is that don't wait for skilled people to come to you go to the university skill them up adopt them that's the only way forward don't let them come up to first 90 grade uh, 90% or uh, 98% and then see that practically they are nowhere just enter in at 12 you want 20 people in one particular field go go to the, that training institute pick them up train them employ them i don't see any gap I don't see any gap. Go to Skill India Mission. Pick up the students you want. If they don't have it, go to the universities. This is the only way forward. This is, I think, the eleventh time I'm speaking on this. I won't speak again. But thanks. <laughs> so there, there has to be an ending to a beginning. <laughs> there has to be an ending to a beginning. So uh, thanks a lot. Thank you for uh, for everything. I think I uh, will take the question on the outside and stuff. The panelists will be here, uh, but I just want to summarize just to wrap it up. I know we are just we are talking about skill first uh, and um, sort of uh, when skills are put first, they're both industry, government, and sort of academy. And I think uh, having discussed this, we have to at least discuss various points. I just want to summarize it. The uh, one we all of us think that the largest youth population is our demographic dividend, and we need to leverage that. Uh, There are many initiatives happening by the government, by the industry, and there needs to be a slightly more cohesive approach towards sharing and exchanging of information so that each one of us are aware of it. Um, the very strong points made on platforms, I think the platforms like SIL, like uh, uh, the the Swayam platform, like uh, what you're doing with the internship and the NAPS platform, etc. Those platforms will enable us to sort of find and break the information asymmetry that exists out there. Uh, the need of the R is collaboration and partnership for building India. 
as a skilled nation, not just for India, but for the world as well, because there's a larger opportunity for us to sort of uh, create global talent pool coming out of India. I just want to end by everything that look, we are in a very interesting stage right now, given the youngest population that we have. We cannot afford to turn old before we turn rich. And that's the reason why putting and investing behind skilling is very critical. And uh, and for that, all of all the ecosystem members have to come together. Glad that the panel had all the industry members from the government as well as um, uh, uh, in the panel sort of people coming from education institutions as well. So the good part is that people are coming together, but a lot more needs to be done in order for us to be ending up at a place where India can be seen as the biggest supplier of talent for the global economy as well. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for all your time.